Ella Fitzgerald was known as the first lady of song, and there is probably no more beloved jazz singer. Born in 1917, Ella was two years younger than Billie Holiday, so the two were very close in terms of the times they grew up in. In contrast to Billie's life, Ella emerged from a troubled childhood to enjoy a long and happy career. Ella was born in Virginia, and her family moved to New York in the early 1920s. Her mother died when she was 15, and so she went to live with her aunt in Harlem. She started to skip school, and she worked as a lookout for a brothel and a gangster. That landed her in the Colored Orphans Asylum, which was like a reform school. In 1934, Ella went to a new show at the Apollo Theater called Amateur Night, where people in the audience were given a chance to perform and win prizes. Amateur Night at the Apollo is still ongoing, and it can be seen as the predecessor to shows like American Idol. When Ella's name was drawn from a hat, she had intended to dance, but she was unnerved by a dance duo called the Edward Sisters who had just performed. Ella said they were the dancingest sisters around. So she opted to sing instead, and she walked away with the first prize. While the choice to sing that night had huge implications for her future career, Ella's love of dancing went back to her childhood when she evidently was a fan of this guy, Earl Snakehips Tucker, who billed himself as the human boa constrictor. Ella's win at the Apollo and a subsequent appearance at the Harlem Opera House brought her to the attention of Chick Webb, who was looking for a new singer for his band at the Savoy. Since Ella was under 18, Chick had to sign on as her legal guardian in order to hire her for his band. In 1938, Ella had her first hit singing with Chick's band on a tune that she based on a child's nursery rhyme, A Tisket A Tasket. It was one of the best-selling records of the decade. This is Ella in 1942, recreating her first hit in an Abbott and Costello comedy movie called Ride 'em Cowboy. A tisket, a tasket, a brown and yellow basket. I send a letter to my mummy on the way I dropped it. I dropped it, I dropped it. Yes, on the way I dropped it. A little girly picked it up and put it in a pocket. She was trucking on down the avenue. But not a single thing to do She went back, back, backing all around When she spied it on the ground She took it, she took it My little yellow basket And if she doesn't bring it back I think that I will die Oh gee, I wonder where my basket can be Sort of way, sort of way, sort of way, sort of way, sort of way Oh dear, I wish that little girl I could see Sort of way, sort of way, sort of way, sort of way, sort of way my yellow basket won't someone help me find my basket and make me happy again again was it red no 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 was it green no 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 was it cerise no <laughs> no no just a little yellow basket <laughs> After Chick Webb died in 1939, Ella took over leadership of the band, which was billed as Ella Fitzgerald and her famous orchestra. Here she is in a 1939 radio broadcast from the Savoy. Ella would have been in her early 20s, and her hard-swinging exuberance was clearly there from the beginning.
afternoon from the drumbeat of a band attuned to the tempo of the times. Music in which the song spoke for itself. The song, of course, was by Ella Fitzgerald, who presented an orchestra from the famous Savoy Ballroom up on Lenox Avenue in the heart of Harlem in New York. Ella's early career got a big boost from the movie star Marilyn Monroe, who told the owners of a high-end club that if they would book Ella, Marilyn would be there every night, which would guarantee press coverage. Ella said of Marilyn, she was ahead of her time and never knew it. I never had to work a small club again. In the 1940s, Ella sang with Dizzy Gillespie's big band, which was a breeding ground for the new music bebop. Ella had the virtuoso vocal chops and the ears to sing bop, and this 1945 recording of Flying Home shows off her ability to scat sing. This was the same year that Charlie Parker released his first record. and bassist Ray Brown met and played together in Dizzy's big band. They were married in 1947 and adopted a son who was born to Ella's sister, who they named Ray Brown Jr. Although bebop was the new thing in jazz, it didn't retain the large audience that existed for swing music. In Ella's words, I had gotten to the point where I was only singing bebop. I thought bebop was it, but it finally got to the point where I had no place to sing. I realized then that there was more to music than bop, and Norman felt that I should do other things. Norman, of course, was Norman Grants, who became Ella's manager in 1956. That same year, Grants founded Verve Records, which grew to contain the world's largest jazz catalog, along with rock artists in later decades. Quoting Norman, I was interested in how I could make Ella a singer with more than just a cult following among jazz fans. So I proposed that the first Verve album would not be a jazz project, but rather a songbook of the works of Cole Porter. The trick was to change the backing enough so that here and there, there would be signs of jazz. That first album led to a series of eight, released over an eight-year period between 1956 and 1964, each featuring songs from specific Tin Pan Alley composers, including Cole Porter, Rodgers and Hart, Duke Ellington, Irving Berlin, George and Ira Gershwin, Harold Arlen, Jerome Kern, and Johnny Mercer. These albums were known as the Songbook series, and the collection of tunes, what we would call standards, became known as the Great American Songbook. They brought attention to what was Grant's third record label, Verve, and established Ella as a quintessential interpreter of popular song. As Irving Berlin said, I never knew how good our songs were until I heard Ella Fitzgerald sing them. 
Frank Sinatra could be considered Ella's counterpart in this regard, although there was a story, and I can't remember which composer it was who complained about Frank reinterpreting the original melody. Frank responded, please return the royalty checks. The implication being that if Ella or Frank would record your song, you stood to make a lot of money. Sinatra's record company Capitol suggested that he release his own version of Ella's songbook series, but he turned them down out of respect for her. A reviewer for the New York Times pointed out a juxtaposition when he wrote, Here was a black woman popularizing urban songs, often written by immigrant Jews, to a national audience of predominantly white Christians. With the success of the songbook series, Ella earned the title First Lady of Song, and she sat atop the jazz and popular music world for the rest of her career. Here we see her in 1981 with President Ronald Reagan. Here's a clip of Ella swinging the blues in 1957. In the band, we see two-thirds of Oscar Peterson's trio with Ray Brown and Herb Ellis on guitar. Ella and Ray had split up as a married couple by that point, but obviously personal issues didn't intrude on their ability to make music together. Ella had the loudest finger snap in the business. There's probably no song more closely associated with Ella Fitzgerald than Mac the Knife. Ella had the ability to make a band swing even harder, and she gives it her all in this performance, breaking into a great Louis Armstrong impersonation at one point. Ella and Louis recorded three albums together, which should be considered required listening. We also see Tommy Flanagan on piano, who was Ella's longtime accompanist and musical director. Just a jackknife has Mac Heath, dear, and he keeps it out of sight. When the shark bites with his teeth, dear, scar the billows, start to spread.
Bobby Jarrett and me and you both singing the same song that she is. The holy grail for an ad company is to come up with a catchphrase that becomes part of the popular culture. For the Memorex cassette tape company, the phrase was, is it live or is it Memorex? We see Nelson Riddle in this commercial, who arranged three of Ella's songbook albums, as well as many of Frank Sinatra's classic records. Are you ready? We're ready, Ella. All right, fellas. Nelson Riddle, you've been arranging the Ella Fitzgerald jazz sound for years. Yes, that's right. Can you tell if that's Ella Live or a recording on Memorex cassette tape with MRX2 Oxide? No, I can't. It's Memorex. That sounds live to me. Is it live or is it Memorex? One, two. Can see. New MRX3 Oxide from Memorex. See, the sound so true, my dears, you won't believe your ears. Woo! MRX3 Oxide makes the difference. You get high as mice and even lower lows. Is it three or me? Nobody knows. <laughs> now, more than ever, we can ask, is it live or is it Memorex?